I am for discipline. I am for clarity. I have invented the word la ville radieuse, which cannot be translated in English. He's usually quoted nearly everything that I have said, and not quite the way I said it. Very, very hard to, I suppose, in architecture, 
it maps a kind of similar type of thing in architecture. Um, so, and I suppose it's this thing that kind of brings me to architecture as a register of culture. Um, architecture, I think, is probably the most significant register of culture due to its breadth and permanence. Um, I think it's, I, I, I love the fact that it's the representation of the ideas of humanity over time. And I love the fact that practicing architecture is an opportunity to engage with that. Um, the ambiguous and metaphysical structures of aesthetics and of art and religion, I think, are important to how cultures describe themselves. I don't think they describe themselves rationally. I think cultures distill ideas to the essential over time, editing out the variances of individual, ego, and fashion. This distillation becomes embedded in their artifacts. They express the identical psychic structures common to all, which together constitute the archaic heritage of humanity, in the words of Jung. Potential ar potent artifacts exist in music, material, culture, art, and architecture. Their poetic cannot be described in language, their essence can only be felt through the nature of the artifact itself. I think we see this in the work of Korb, and in the work of Pickler, and in the work of Kahn. But I think it's in material culture that the artifact is most easily identified in objects that are beautifully distilled examples of the symbiosis of the physical nature of the place, the art of making, and the traditions that require them. Vernacular architecture is similar. A distillation of the material nature of a place, climate, and the rituals of life. They are not abstract entities where life is excluded, they highlight the consistencies and inconsistencies of life, a culture, and a place. Cultures distort and cross-pollinate with wider ideas to map thought and social history. It develops divergent influences and pushes ideas forward. It makes a rich tapestry of place. I'm particularly interested in atmospheric buildings that we inhabit. It touches on the poetics of artifacts already outlined. But it also, through the careful study of interior space, the poetics of the interior. I think proportion and light in the way we move through spaces and sound is how we find the atmosphere of interior spaces. I don't think we think in fully formed worlds, but I think we think in fragments. We respond to things intuitively that map our poetic subconscious. We collect and assemble fragments of ideas in our work. <coughs> An exploration of the metaphysics of architecture, I think, is a very, very hard thing. It's a very difficult area in which to work. So how do we explore it? In looking at architecture in the 20th century, I think there has been an emphasis on the theoretical underpinning of architecture development through manifesto and writing. For example, international modernism, postmodernism, and deconstructivism. I think at best, it has produced an architecture for a new age and at worst a known game or a theoretical construct. Wittgenstein says that language has an underlying logical structure, an understanding of which shows the limits of what can be clearly and meaningfully be said and therefore taught. But there are limits to what can be meaningfully said and therefore taught through language. Beyond this, language becomes nonsense and the traditional problems of philosophy arise. He says that areas beyond the limits of language and linguistic thought are not nonsensical, but are the matters of aesthetics, religion, and the poetic. They are the things that cannot be put into words. They are what is mystical. I think architecture is beyond the limits of language and linguistic thought. I think theoretical writings can be descriptive, but cannot directly engage with the fundamental poetic of architecture. Contemporary architects that have explored the poetic have engaged with language in a different way, as pieces of divination in their own right. This is evident in the writings of Caesar, Kahn, and Fenn, among others. They write like the poets who use language to point at something outside the language itself. It's going to catch up. Um, they also have explored their work through irrational poetic devices that are instinctual and personal. They, have, they are always embedded in conversation with the culture in which they work. The rules of architecture have always been the same. I think Kant puts it very well when he says that drawings are expressions of one striving to reach the spirit of architecture. So really that's my way of introduction. Um, 
and then on to practicing architecture. I was, um, I think I, I graduated in 2002, um, and my first project after college was, um, and what I'd like to do maybe tonight is talk about the practice over the last 10 years. Um, when I left college, the first project that I worked on was with Donny and Diamond on a project in Donegal for friends who are traditional musicians. I think I was very lucky to work with Will and Marcus. It was an apprenticeship where I learned the art of building. Carrick Finn is located on the southeast coast of an island connected to the mainland by a sandbar. It is an incredible landscape, changing with the tide and looking back towards Donegal and Errigal in the distance. The house is from Ray, Nguyen and Darren Byrne, who are well-known Donegal musicians and whose cultural home was Donegal. They wanted, to, uh, they wanted a place for musicians to congregate in Donegal and to play music. The project allowed or required us to enter into a conversation with the nature of the landscape and the culture of the place, the nature of interior space through sound and presence, and the art of building. We studied landscape at various scales, we map both the existing culture and the cultural memory, identifying the important cultural artefacts of the domesticity. We also began thinking about sound and space. This is the plan of Ravenna, um, and I think it's a hugely important influence. Christian churches, I think, are very interesting because um, they have led to the development of Western classical music. Because of their long reverberation times, they've kind of outlined harmonic structures, they've outlined kind of harmo harmo harmonic musical world. I think Ravenna is kind of interesting because it's got this middle space, which is two story high, which is wrapped by a necklace of acoustic, of secondary acoustic spaces out here, here, and here. I think that's really interesting because. Um, the, long, the reverberation time of the period in the middle is extended by the reverberation. It's extended. Reverberation time is time that when you play a note in this zone, the note travels to the wall and comes back to all surfaces and comes back to the original point. In this instance, because of this collection of spaces, reverberation time is lengthened to travel out here and then back, and indeed out here and back into this space giving you a kind of a broader delay on music so that it feels like a much warmer space to play in. Also the geometries of these spaces colour that music so that actually you get a much more sophisticated tone based on the fact that all these different geometries are reverberating themselves and colouring the central sound again. So for Carrick Finn this is hugely important because when we were developing this we decided that the space, the main space in the house, which was being the middle, would be flanked again by a next of acoustic spaces, which is the accommodation like um, bedrooms, sitting room and so on. And then that would influence the reverberation time and also the colour of the sound <coughs> in the kitchen. Normally houses have, depends on the type of house, but um, yeah, it, it gets over the problem of having fairly small rooms and, and privacy by wrapping the, the main space by a collection of of all of the other spaces in the house. And so that brought us to this plan here, where the kitchen is in the middle of the house, the, the accommodation drop around, and there are corners opened up for views and so on. The kitchen then is developed and it modulated to kind of further explore this. So the kitchen, for example, the ground becomes um, stepped, becomes relaxed. So that there's a number of different dimensions between floor and ceiling, the only remaining parallel surfaces. And that means that rather than having one dimension, you get a number of dimensions, which again causes different reflective, it causes different standing waves to occur in the space. Then materiality is developed for reflection of sound and the coefficient of absorption. This wasn't the only thing, it also meant that the kind of, we had to engage with the landscape, trying to develop an architecture that embedded itself in Donegal with an attention to detail and to view, but also registered the kind of domestic artefacts like fireplace, chimney, and so on that people in Donegal, um, I think, poetically connect with. So that's Project in Carrickfin, Carrickfin and Donny and Diamond. Um, I left Donny and Diamond in 2007 to um, establish my own practice. The main reason for this was so that I could tour, play music and tour, 
and work at architecture independently. It worked for a little while, it didn't work anymore. Anyway. So one of the first kind of projects that we, we really built actually in practice was um, a project in UCD which is called Sounding Boxes. Um, this was in collaboration with Dara Bracken and Dawn Siggins. Um, but it, it was built by a team of amazing people in two weeks in UCD. What I was really looking at is developing ideas that were kind of established and carried for in about standing waves that rather than sound being something that gets applied to buildings afterwards by an acoustician, that actually becomes part of the conversation of architecture. So in trying to look at this, we essentially built a uh, building of one-to-one, -one, albeit a very small building. Um, we, we mapped the building spaces to look at standing waves in those spaces, mapped the sound that it produced through animation and sound, um, and these things for this came out of a kind of renaissance idea, music of the spheres, proportion and so on. So the basic premise of the thing was that rooms, sorry, rooms of standing waves. So standing waves occur in a room where you have two parallel walls um, to a multiple of the dimension of a wavelength of a note, like the top, the top diagram of space. What happens is the wavelength goes back over itself and because it's a perfect match backwards and forwards, it amplifies itself and that note jumps out, it becomes louder in the room. And that's why things like recording studios and so on are usually dampened down because you don't want that normally. But in relaxed space, I think that becomes very important. It's why cathedrals sound nice, all those types of things. So in looking at that, we decided we'd try and develop that. So we took the geomonic scale, which is a particular type of scale, um, and mapped the harmonics of it. How it works is if you take an instrument like a string and you map its har har harmonic position. So if you take a string on a violin, for example, and it's like this is a D string. If you put your, your hand in the middle without pressing between the bridge and the top of the, of the fingerboard, you get the first harmonic, the second harmonic is in this position, the third harmonic, the fourth harmonic, the fifth harmonic, and the sixth harmonic. And they're harmonics that have meaning on a scale. So for example, that's an octave of this note, that's a fifth of that note, and so on and so forth. So if you multiply through that and you pick nine notes in any harmonic scale, you get um, what's known as kind of Western octave scale. So don't worry, we fossil a lot you go. So we examined this and we chose a particular type of scale to try and develop a piece of architecture that can respond to it. And so what we did was we took um, the notes that we were looking at that made the full band of nine notes in a G-harmonic scale we mapped the, the dimensions on plan and in elevation and built three notes for the x, y and z coordinates. Then we went to the, and built a frame that matched that proportion. Then we went to the second one and by including a secondary frame we were able to reduce the scale to match these notes. Third one we did the same and fourth one. And then the fourth one when you stand at the centre point of this plan here you can listen to all three spaces at once and register all notes. Also that sets up a proportional system by which you end up with a, a proportional system which is exactly like the golden mean or um, the kind of traditional portions of classicism. And then we built it. Um, we originally built it to have a range of materials that were chosen on their reflective properties but we couldn't afford that so we ended up using plywood and it's not bad actually. Then we went on to test it. So, Don, uh, who was a composer, made a series of compositions that were projected into this room. And we used a kind of technique that Alvin Lucy um, identified in his piece, I'm Sitting in a Room, whereby you project sound into the room, you record the room, and then you project the recording into the room again. It was a way of emphasizing or uh, accentuating the natural properties of the room. And we played it into the room, we set it up in UCD, and a number of other places we played into the room, and it was lovely to see, because it becomes kind of like a sound sauna, and it was interesting, because kids run in and out, and they, it makes it, uh, they react to it, is all I can say, it's kind of interesting. So you can see here, this is the kind of study, the animations of the process, so you can see here, these are noise bursts played into the room, so they're full of noise, all, all of the wavelengths are in these noise bursts. And you can see here, through period of process of the, the Lucier process, you can see the notes that are in the room becoming apart. Similarly here. So these are different rooms. We also then used it as a compositional tool and started projecting clouds of sound into the room 
that would then, where the reverberance would become apparent, kind of in the cloud. So I'm going to see if I can just jump over and maybe let you listen to that for a minute. This might not work, but hopefully it will. So we can see some of these exercises maybe. Let's start with maybe a noise burst because it's a clear one. So you can hear the noise burst coming into the room here. And you can't hear anything? Wonderful. So you can hear the resonant frequencies in the room becoming apparent over time. Not really. So that's that. Anyway. Then you can hear Dolan starting to have a lot of fun with that. In terms of building clouds of sound that would reverberate in the room. So these are just basic notes that he's playing in. Then he moves to making a series of chords with glide pedal first, which I won't go to that. <laughs> and then he starts, in those ones, he starts exploring that a little bit more. Is that enough to turn it off? <coughs> okay, so that's that. So moving on then, I'd like to talk a little bit about the project that we did for the Royal Hibernian Academy, which is a model project. Can you see that? Yeah. We're stuck on the moment. So this is a project that we did for Royal, uh, an exhibition that um, we were in with Clancy Moore, Port uh, Culligan Deegan, <laughs> Ryan Cunningham Architects and Taka. Um, it was a project that myself and Noelle Green did. Um, it was a study kind of of a project that was on site at the time in Bob West and it was a way of looking at some of the ideas that we were looking at earlier on in terms of influences. A way of looking maybe of distilling a project down into an, to look at it as potential as an artifact, to look at those kind of characteristics of it. We wanted to do it in a way that was making something because, again back to the idea, not trying to describe it through language but trying to make it in a way that allowed us to think about it in another way. So what we did is we started looking at, we cast it. Uh, we cast it where we wanted it to look, we wanted it to look at it as an object. And we wanted, I suppose, to eliminate things like joints and so on. And to see by casting it, could we look at it as an object in conversation with the landscape and so on. And also maybe as a slight artifact. But then the other side of it was that idea of making it. And the nice thing about making it was by casting it, we were able to explore the potential in casting something within a kind of strict parameters of architecture. And I think it's really beautiful that you get, you kind of set up this form and that the sedimentary nature of casting something opens up a whole different exploration, which I think is a very beautiful thing about that model. Otherwise, I think there is, as a kind of young practice, we do a lot of kind of extensions. Well, not a lot, but we do a number of extensions. And I think what's really interesting about those is that they allow us a chance to test things. Um, I think what's important for me in testing extensions is they allow me to look at lip space, which I think is very important. Um, they allow me to think spatially. They allow me to practice detailing, which I think is very important as well. I think the detailing thing is really important. It was, it was through the work through extensions that, as much as I've discovered so far in terms of detail, which I firmly believe is about detailing dissolving to support the architecture so that it becomes almost invisible. In the same way as, say, ornamentation in music, in a really good music, dissolves just to make music. And I think detail is kind of like that. Um, unsuccessfully deployed, no doubt, but uh, still something I think that we're interested in exploring. So this project, that project was a project in Portobello, where we just, very, very small yard, and we had to infill and carve a courtyard into a very, very dense set of terraces. In this project, it was an example development project where we were left with a kind of triangular piece behind the existing house, and we kind of made, we just basically built the regulations where we didn't go beyond anything that they wanted to build very quickly, so it had to come under exempted development. And so it became a kind of isosceles triangle project, um, split in the middle to allow light deep into the plan. I think what's most interesting for me about this was its relationship with the house. Um, originally, I thought that this should be solid, and the times were so sure that this had to be opened up, and they were absolutely right. What's really nice about it is kind of the off that it sets up. 
and the kids just run around like this all day long and quite lovely. But the other nice thing about it is that this was the existing house, the original house, and so it filled this area. This area was their backyard. So the garden goes off at this kind of jaunty angle up here. So rather than pushing out and looking at this area, by turning this this way we were able to re-engage with the garden. We were able to make a very generous kitchen along here that ended in the stove. We were able to put the table right at the best location looking at the garden and to make a seat and so on. Um, and what's really nice about it was that I, didn't, I wasn't involved in the construction of it. Um, <laughs> Martin Brennan did the construction and he's a wonderful man. Uh, and he built the project and literally turned up in the last day and he just built it the way that I'd drawn it up to the level that I'd done, which is quite, quite a way. So this is the project in Glass Nevin. Um, it's kind of 1930s house, which had problems because it's kind of built on very, very unstable ground. Um, so we literally all we did was to put a new room onto the edge of the house to open up the kitchen. I think the really nice thing about that was uh, an opportunity to just look at the interior space. Um, and to see how you spawn, how you make a kind of interior room. There were a lot of kind of difficulties with it. The orientation was very, very poor. Um, the garden was north facing and so on. So it became a kind of interesting thing about bathroom, about figuring out where exactly you put a ceiling so that you make a garden which is part of the room but no other landscape beyond that garden has anything to do with the house. And then there's another conversation which is about the level of the sill and the relationship towards the ground outside. And that's really the extent of the project, also lets in a lot. Um, so in a way, again, it's that thing of look, looking at detail in a very kind of rational and straightforward way and not over-worrying, I suppose, in a way, although I do over-worry. Um, but just to find yourself at a place where you can, having gone through this kind of long, protracted design thing, that you just end back where you should have been in the first place. I think that's kind of interesting. So, um, the two projects, I suppose, that started the office were one was Bob West, which is for Paul Common, and then the other one was a house in Valley Edmund, which I'll talk about later on. Um, so, the house Bob West is in South East Wexford. Um, I think Wexford is a very interesting county. Um, its proximity to Europe and to the UK means that it just uh, has this loads of immigrant populations coming through and through and through. And I think it's adapted to that cultural change is very, very well. I think, for example, Wexford has its own language for a little while, um, the south, south of Wexford. So I think Wexford is very interesting because it kind of goes back to the thing I was talking about earlier about divergent cultural influences and being able to kind of start a conversation with kind of culture of place, not only looking at the site but also looking at its culture. But the site was very interesting. It was um, the site of a ruined house. It was Paul's uncle's house. He left it to him in the world. Um, and it kind of showed that cultural um, build-up, I suppose, is what you'd say. Um, it was interesting because it was a farmhouse. It was one deep, one room deep, three rooms long. It uh, had an upstairs, so it was kind of a traditional farmhouse. But it had this kind of middle house facade. So I suppose it had notions of operosity, which is kind of lovely. Um, so when we went down, and the nice thing about it was that all the windows, the usual proportions of a middle-sized house, a crazy middle-sized house, were kind of gone that it was kind of stretched and distorted, and there was much more wall, much less window, and so on. So we were kind of very interested in this. Also, Paul wanted a house that looked like a house. That's all he really wanted. Um, so I suppose it led us to look at things like a um, middle-sized house, and I think you know, a lot of its kind of architecture comes out of this type of building, with the cornice, the chin, the roof, um, the piano noble, steps up, uh, and the basement. I think it also speaks to kind of a idea of the object in the landscape in Ireland. I think Ireland is very interesting because I think the landscape responds to kind of rugged objects, kind of fairly straightforward objects. Um, but I think those objects are very beautifully made mostly. Um, and I think that is why it works so well. So it responds to the kind of material or natural kind of personality of the place. So we began looking at this site, which was, um, that was how we found it. Road, beautiful lane, down to the house, there was a mobile home here, which had been gotten rid of. Then there was a series of haggard walls, which were just here. This used to be old sheds, and then I'm really sure how this is used. So, we wanted, I suppose, to build on this, in a way, but the house had to come down because it was falling down, it was dangerous. So the house came down, we, we, we took the stone, and uh, we refurbished those walls, 
and extended them to make a walled orchard here. And that's the original ruins of the house here. So that was the kind of first move. And once we established that, we decided to um, put the new house right on the boundary line between the back haggard and the front haggard. The nice thing about that on the ground floor is it makes a series of kind of intimate courtyards which are speaking, I suppose, to the natural uh, contours of the site, but also to kind of things like the laneways and the ditches and so on. It also meant that the most, the orientation, which was not great because this was north, so south was towards the road, meant that we could shield the kind of private areas of the house from the road, but also let the light in. So that's kind of the original site plan, and it's very straightforward really. And then we started looking at how to build on it. Um, so you can see here obviously the direct influence from the middle sized house um, with the Yellow Nobly where the, the accommodation is, the main living areas are, and then you get kind of more intimate bedroom spaces below relating to the terraces that are just in front which are south facing and then that wall demarcates boundary. And um, you get your obviously your corn, you get your corn detail, you get your chimney which is reconsidered here as a roof shot. It also kind of carefully sits into the landscape, so it talks to the lane. The nice thing, it's kind of difficult to decide where to position it, um, and we decided that to, we just walked around and decided that actually it wants to have a conversation with the lane, it wants to have a conversation with the land, the back and the view, a conversation with the field over here and here, so it became quite clear where the house wanted to sit. It wants to take view then towards the landscape to the rear. So when we were looking at this, we were, um, so you can see here the plan, the plan is very simple, down the lane, you come into an entrance courtyard here, over your head is a concrete sausage and a hole in it for a tree to be planted, um, so you can come in through the doorway here into this hallway. Alternatively, you can come in here, pack your car in the garage and come in here. In this hallway, it's very easy, just place to hang your coat and so on, and then you come up these stairs to this area here. And at that point, you get a view towards the landscape. You also get access out into this very generous terrace, which feels like made ground rather than terrace. And I think that's important for the landscape upstairs. Then you get dining area, kitchen, bit of bathroom, utility room, kind of kitchen stuff. And then you get your living areas here, which are quite generous. And you get a space to below here. This is the downstairs is the play area, uh, kids' bedrooms opening out into a terrace, master bedroom, ensuite, main bathroom. The terraces outside are split so that you get a master terrace, you get a rainwater pool dividing, delineating boundary again, and then you get the kids in the room. They can actually come up into the orchard and back down again to access here. So that's the general plan. The roof then sits over the living spaces, meaning that we can explore the spatial, this and kind of more spatial depth. So we, the roof structure is a kind of three dimensional truss. It's got, it works in this way, opening up four quadrants one, two, three, and four. The roof light is exposed open to the living room in this area and it's got a shelf here um, for storage and for various reasons. Paul was going to meditate there actually, but he never did that. And then, um, so that really kind of camouflages your view of the roof light to come up the stairs. So that's the general plan. The section then kind of develops that, so you get this. It section kind of works in terms of horizontal and vertical spaces. So this is a horizontal space out here, but it, one side of the bedroom can open up. So this is like a study room. It has um, how am I doing the time? Sorry. Okay. So this is a, a play area, which is double story height and gives you a view through the spaces up vertically. Whereas the kind of datum set up by the cornice and by the sill kind of demarcate horizontal spaces. Again, horizontal space from the living rooms. Um, vertical space as well. So it's this kind of mesh of two different types of spatial, um, spatial plays. And you can see that in um, studies in the model. And actually what's interesting about this is this is not the way it is. That actually when we were looking at how domestically to orientate the spaces, that a kind of other counterpoint needed to happen. And that became about the furniture. So that actually this is here, you feel this kind of space, but then that space is further carved. I think the technicalities of this the way that we work, the technicalities of here are interesting. So these are the original walls, uh, and we just simply built cavity construction on the inside of that wall there. And then the two beams, which demarcate kind of first floor area, split, 
allowing the insulation through. So the cavity is this very simple, normal cavity, and the windows can position themselves uh, in in conversation with that, with the thermal, with the thermal. And that makes deep areas for our um, gutters, and it also allows us to look at the structure internally of the roof. And then the elevations within that work very much in conversation with the structure in the organisation. In terms of the furniture, the furniture is then put in to counterpoint how the spaces work. So they just do different things. For example, the fireplace is in, it's reflective, so it gives you a kind of, it, it highlights the kind of axial, the axial, axial position of the windows which face north, south, east, west. And then they start making domestic space internally. So that's the top of the stairs, looking down along the long view. Then there's another conversation, I suppose, which is the thing about structure, uh, being very apparent in the side, but also in conversation with things like the furniture. So there's a fine detail to try and make sure everything works together, including the light fittings that hang down into the space, um, showing you the space in the habitable in the lower, the lower areas. So that's kind of bug I think the thing that was kind of interesting for me in it was devices like windows. So windows are um, Windows are pushed out into the outer zone of the wall. The thing about a thick wall is that the windows become really interesting. In this instance, we didn't want to detach the upper floor from the lower floor, so the windows had to push out into the outer face of the wall, so that people could step into these kind of bay windows that are embedded in the walls, and take a view of the landscape, and take a view back down onto the ground. It also works in the bedrooms, because by doing that, in the bedrooms also they get, sorry, the back left thing, which is here, no, next one, sorry. Here, that you get possibility of making bay windows within the thickness of the wall on the ground floor as well. And that allows you to have a bay window which you can sit in, but on one side you have a door which leads out into the terrace, which is in the depth of the wall, and on the other side you have a little bench. And I think that's quite interesting on the elevation because it allows you to push the, the opening sections deep into the window reveal, giving shadow, and also allows you to do the same on the ground floor, opening up that area. I think that's it. The thing I suppose that I found interesting about it was the kind of imperfect nature of things. And I think it's really nice because the walls, for example, we had to rebuild a lot of the walls actually because of the problem on site. And so we rebuilt them in the same way again. But what's really nice is setting up ways of doing things so that the people who are doing them, who are not experts, that, that kind of imperfect poetry becomes present in the work. And I think that's kind of interesting in terms, especially how things meet other things. For example, the render just meets the top. It's not exactly right but it's nice. This isn't exactly right, but it's nice. And so there's kind of wide tolerances for things, so that actually, by getting things wrong, it kind of adds some flavor. Then the other project that I'd like to talk about is, is Valia Eamon, which is a project in Wicklow. And again, it kind of enters into a conversation with the place. So you see um, kind of local tradition of an actor, which is longhouses, actually. Kind of longhouses with kind of new classical facades. And so we were interested again in this, um, it also, the client wanted to have something which is quite traditional, but he wanted to find interior spaces that were a little bit more complex and contemporary. Uh, a really important aspect of this project was windows. Um, uh, I think this is kind of a good image to show that kind of architecture of the window. And in our case, it became kind of the generating thing of the house, where you get windows on the ground floor, which are sash windows, which open up into these areas above, um, and they open up the full ground floor area so that uh, there's a connection between the inside and the outside because the site plan operates in a series of courtyards. So this, it was interesting because we, we went through the project, we went into planning and so on, and we hadn't really worked all this stuff out. So when we did work it all out, which is after planning, you know, we had to go back to planning again. So the client was very understanding and thought it was important enough to do, but it's kind of interesting because it allows one is to find detail to really, really tell you how to make a house. Um, we'll talk maybe a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, so the side plan is very simple. This is a laneway. Um, there's a forecourt here where you park your car. Uh, there was originally another two-story building to be built here, which was like an office upstairs and a little garage downstairs, but that was never built due to budget. Uh, I think it was a lot better. It would be a lot better with it, actually. But, so you come into this courtyard here, slip into an kind of area here which is south facing where they keep all their plants and so on. And that brings you into the house at this point. It means that the, all this accommodation is private. Down here you have a courtyard which faces south. 
which is this amazing kind of landscape with trees and so on. And then you have a kitchen garden to the west with a rainwater pool and a kind of planting area back here. So that's generally the plan on the ground floor, how it kind of sets up off the site. Again, it's kind of that interest in the object in the landscape, that thing of detail, that thing of how the thing is made. So I've kind of talked a little bit about the plan, but I'll talk a little more about it. Um, it's very simple, it's very straightforward. The windows that are opening are here. These windows operate differently. These are the windows that are open upwards. Potentially this one as well, but we didn't actually, that one doesn't open. Um, and then you have a utility room here, planting room, toilet downstairs here, which is shielded by this wall that drains the roof into a rainwater pool. Uh, sitting room here, and the dining area in this is kind of the centre of the project. In a way, it's kind of like those projects, those classical projects that have the long wings to both sides, um, but we've turned it kind of inside out. So rather than looking at the facade of a kind of Gandon building with its two long wings, you're sitting here, you're looking at the space, and you're looking at the wings in the other direction, in a way. So, in a way, it's nice because it gives you landscape of ground, it also gives you landscape of building, both sides. Around here, then, you get a two-story high space, which is, as you come up the stairs here, you overlook that space on the way up, and you have a very, very large fireplace here again. On the upper floor, you come to here, there's a little study here, behind the, behind the chimney press, the chimney stack, with a little um, stove here. And then this is their academics, so they have a lot of books, and so they want a place to store them. So this is like a huge bookshelf all the way along this gallery, um, and that's full of books. And then you enter through that bookshelf into a bedroom, which is discreet, or you walk around it at the end to the main bedroom, which takes views back over the landscape. You come through again for the bathroom in this location here. The, again, the thing about that is really interesting. So you have to be able to modulate between uh, so things like something bass become important because the ground plane is a thing that's set and everything has to work around those. Which is probably not right and I'll probably do it differently now. So you can see that sets up conversation with the elevations quite clearly. Um, the gable elevations are different. Um, there's the piece that wasn't built and there's the other piece. So talking about those windows in some detail, I've become very interested in this detail here and how you make a sash box in a way and how that sets up a language of column, how it sets up a language of beam, how it let, sets up a language of pearl, and then how you start building up from there. And in a way that the kind of weight of the bookshelves come down through the structure. And it's very unfinished in a way, the way it's made is kind of how it ends. Um, so you see just the concrete that makes the structure, and then you see the fireplace and you see the areas over. This is the sitting room, looking back, that's the kitchen. Looking down along, that's the room, that's the utility room, and then that's just the concrete purchase. And so again, it's kind of a language of just, I suppose, um, ground meeting structure that comes down from above. It allows us to develop detail that matches that. And you can see, you see here the structure with the sash windows beyond. And it sets up this kind of conversation through the house, through the courtyard, so you can run from one side to the other. And then I set up a language of entrance room, and I set up that kind of small language of just kitchen table and opening the sash window. Yeah, and that's them opening up. And they're light, they're nice. So that kind of brings me to the end of what I'm going to talk about tonight. I would like to just maybe read out one quote, um, which is. Somewhere here, in French. Yeah, I'd just like to read a piece of text by Caesar. Um, I really like the way Caesar writes. Um, and I think this describes the Villa Savoy in a really nice way. Um, so Picasso said that you needed 10 years to learn how to draw, and then another 10 years to learn how to draw like a child. These last 10 years seem to be missing nowadays in the learning of architecture. The delight of a visit to the Villa Savoy comes from the encounter with a kind of naivete and with constant transformation of each idea. I, for one, look forward to learning how to draw like a child. Thanks very much for listening.